So, the greeting begins with verse 4, says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So that's the greeting. The greeting, it starts John saying, it is John who's writing the greeting. It is to the seven churches which are in Asia. And it's from the Lord. It's from God himself. Now, these seven churches, now in Scripture, to the seventh church, which I believe is where we are today. The, the church, prophetically, that is described at the end of chapter 3. But that's then we'll get there sooner or later i don't know when but today we want to just look at what this says to john to the seven churches which are in asia now we're talking about the specific seven churches they are in asia they're actually in western turkey what we call western turkey today um, a group of churches some bigger some smaller uh, no particular reason why these seven churches um, Seems to me there was uh, an order to the where they are and the circle that they made, and the, I'll try to research that some more for next week or the week after. But um, the big thing is, the important thing is, it is a message to the church, and the first thing, the first word of the message is grace. Isn't that awesome? Grace. God's desire is grace. I looked up a new definition for it because I've always just call it unmerited favor, you know, or something like that, but it's this definition says unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification or favor or pardon. It's God's blessing, you know, His grace, His amazing grace. 
because, and, and we've talked about this before, justice. What is justice? Justice is getting what you deserve. I love justice for somebody else. I don't like it for me. I don't want justice. I want mercy, right? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. God is just. Sin needs to be dealt with. And it was dealt with in the person of Jesus Christ. We'll remember that today in communion. Uh, he paid the price for your sin and my sin. And that was God's justice being satisfied. But God is merciful. And so he put our sin on Jesus and gave us his righteousness. His, his righteousness that allows us to spend an eternity with a holy, loving God. What an awesome exchange that is. Here, you take my sin, Jesus. I'll take your righteousness so I can live in heaven forever. What a trade. I like deals like that. I've never really gotten many of those, but that's a good one. He took my punishment, and I get his eternal life. What an awesome thing. That's grace. Because grace is not just getting mercy, not getting the bad you don't deserve. I mean, the bad you do deserve. Not getting that bad. That's justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace is getting something that is even far greater than you ever could have hoped for. The greatest thing you can ever imagine. We only see it dimly right now. It's hard to get the concept of heaven down because we have no real reference point. I mean, there's a little bit in chapter 22 when we get there, talking about heaven, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, suffering, all that stuff. Heaven's going to be awesome. No more flesh to deal with. No more appetites of the flesh to deal with. It's going to be awesome. Heaven's going to be wonderful. And that's God's grace that allows us to have access to heaven. But grace to you and peace. Peace. I looked that up too. A state of tranquility or quiet. That's not good. A state of quiet or harmony. Grace and peace. Grace always comes first. Because you can't have peace if you don't have grace. Not the peace that God gives. Oh, there are attempts at it. We'll try to get all kinds of things. Chemicals or, or distractions. Maybe it's money for some. Or it's, it's uh, pleasure in some other way for others. Seeking some form of this blessing that God has for us. They're all fakers. None of them satisfy. None of them will really give us the peace that comes from a right relationship with Jesus Christ. So grace to you and peace. The bestower of grace and true peace is God. You just can't find it any other way. It doesn't come any other way. You know, there are, are two types of people on planet Earth. That's it. Only two. Saved and unsaved. Those who are in the kingdom of God and those who are not. That's it. You know, we live in a time where man wants to divide us into so many categories. Want to divide us by race. Want to divide us by gender. And not that, you know, two isn't enough for gender. We've got to invent a whole bunch more. I don't know how many we're up to now. I know it's more than 56 because that was the last time I heard, and I know they've added some since then. It's probably somewhere around 150 by now. Come on. In the beginning, God created them. <laughs> Male and female created he them. That's it. Male or female. That's it. But they want to create this whole... Division. They want to divide us by race, by gender, by nationality. They want to divide us by economic uh, status or by age even. They've got all kinds of things they want to divide us by. Now when I get something in the mail, like the census that we just filled out, they ask my race, I put human. That's it. That's what there is. There's one. There aren't a whole bunch of races. My nationality, I'm American. I don't put Irish, I don't put English. My ancestors were from there. The potato famine happened. My great-great-grandfather was some, somewhere down the family tree. I never met. We can do Noah and his wife, I suppose. We're descendants of them. 
One race. Most likely, Adam and Eve were a brown-skinned couple. Because when you look at the variations that have come from them, some are darker than that and some are lighter than that. But who cares? They, they want to tell me I'm white. This is white. <laughs> it looks a little brown to me. Compared to white, one race, the human race. So that's what I always write. I write human. Don't try to divide us. But see, they want to divide us because they want power. <laughs> My nationality is American. My economic status, I'm wealthy. My dad owns a, the cattle on a thousand hills. My God, so shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. But even apart from that, as an American, you know the poorest American is in the top 5% in the world. There's a lot of poor people on this planet, and we ain't it. And they want to get us to be covetous. They want us to look at things we don't have instead of realizing, look at what we do have. We got it pretty good. But they want to sow dissatisfaction in our hearts to further divide us and separate us. They want to make a, a you know, all this division has a purpose. Because the elites want to destroy our country so they can build it back up as a global socialist utopia. In their mind, that's what they're doing. And this is what's best for mankind. Of course, they will be the elite still. And the rest of us will just be everybody else. We'll have the haves and the have-nots in a way like we've never seen before. But they will promise us the world, and they won't deliver. But see, that's what they want. Two types of people, that's all they want. Not saved and unsaved. They want... The elite and everybody else. That's what their goal is. Foolishness and craziness. And the things that God calls sin that they want us to accept. They want us to accept now transgenders. Guys who are born as men, who have male parts, should not be competing on a girl's sports team. That's just unfair. It's not right. And we're not supposed to say that there's anything wrong with that. Well, of course there's something wrong with that. Don't be stupid, you know? Come on. But no, it's intolerant. No, well, it's not. It's not intolerant. It's wrong. And people are, are choosing all these different things. Well, who are you? Well, hello, my name is Dennis and I'm an alcoholic. Well, you don't have to be an alcoholic. Or, hello, my name is Dennis, and I'm a, a drug user, or drug abuser, or, or, or whatever. All these different identities we can have. Or, I'm a this, or I'm a that. You pick it. I don't know. It's crazy, though. What's going on in our world right now? In the book of Judges, at the end of the book, it talks about how everyone did what was right in their own eyes. God, we don't care. Jerry Nadler, what he just said, God has no bearing on what we're going to pass here in Congress. That's the whole problem, Jerry Nadler. He should. You know, the, the privilege that I have. White privilege. You guys have white privilege? White privilege that, you know, I remember all this privilege that no food in the house, six kids in the house, that, you know, brought up. Having the government cheese and, and I mean, that's, okay, that's privilege, I guess. It's amazing the things that I have seen that, and the things I've been through and the things you have that we have been through. The trials and the troubles and yet they want to divide. The division, the division. So how do we help these people? Because that's what they need is they need our help. But we need to pray for them. But really, how did Jesus help us? Because we all had a distorted perception of reality. You know, that's what this is with the the transgender right now, which is a big thing. What they're seeing on the inside of their brain is not what they see on the outside of their body. But they want to tell me that it's there, that I have to accept this craziness. And even in little kids, the changes that they want to do, put them on uh, hormone therapy. And they want to do gender reassignment surgery. And if you really study into that, which I haven't done much of, but there's an awful lot of people 
who go through all of that business and they come out and they're still dissatisfied. Because what they thought they needed in their brain is not what they needed. Because what they need is a right relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to know who God is. And it's the same for anybody that's pursuing anything else. Power, prestige, honor, whatever it is, it's not going to satisfy. It's grace and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's where it comes from. The grace and the peace that people are seeking after is only found in Jesus Christ. And so what we have here in verse 4, it begins with that. From him, who? The Father. From God. Grace and peace to you from Him. It comes from Him. He's the only source of it. And you'll never be satisfied pursuing anything but Him. But if you pursue Him, you won't be satisfied. I tried it for 24 years. The other way, it didn't work so well. I've been <laughs> over 40 years. Wow, how, how did that happen? Pursuing the Lord. I have no regrets of bowing my knee and surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. No regret. It's been 40 years, yes, up and down. It isn't always perfect, but there's always that peace that comes from God. Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come. Eternally past, eternity past, eternity future. He's there. God is never going to leave us or forsake us. He is there. He is the eternal one. That's who he is. He's the, he rules the past, he rules the present, he rules the future. And that's an awesome thing to consider. And then we have this, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. This speaks of the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity here in verses 4, 5, 6, 7. And we've talked about Jesus in a bunch of it. But here we have the Holy Spirit. So why does it say seven spirits? Again, that's speaking of the fullness, the completeness. Um, as we talked about last week, a lot of what we see in the book of Revelation, we have to go back into the Old Testament mainly to get insight into what it's speaking of. And this is from Isaiah chapter 11. You want to go back there. Talking about the seven spirits, it's really the, um, the number seven again. Speaking of perfection. And they're not seven different spirits, but seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we find here. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord, that's the first thing. Of the seven, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of, no spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. That's the seven aspects of the Holy Spirit that we find. He is the one giving us grace and peace, along with the Father, because there's one God. Revealed to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we have this Spirit, as it's listed here in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, from the seven spirits, or seven aspects of the Holy Spirit, who are before His throne. That's the idea there. And then we get to verse 5. And you could... That word in there. He's the faithful martyr. He's the one who died for us. But he's also a faithful witness to declare to us who God is. And we see that throughout Scripture. The whole book is about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about him. And he's revealed to us certainly here as well as other places. But Jesus is faithful to the Father. And he's faithful to you and I, faithful to his people, even unto death. To his death. He's the faithful witness. 
The next thing we see is he's the firstborn from the dead. I like the fact that he's the firstborn from the dead. That means there's a secondborn and a thirdborn and there's going to be other people that rise from the dead. The resurrection to life. He was the first. But it also speaks as firstborn that he's preeminent. <coughs> in all. If we looked through the Old Testament and we looked at the emphasis that was always placed on the firstborn. They always had a double portion. They were always the greater. And so it is with Jesus. He is the firstborn. <coughs> Uh, the greatest of all. He's number one. That's a good place to be. You know, he's the most important. After that, we see that he is the ruler over the kings of the earth. If it was, my servants would fight. Someday he's coming, though. He will rule and reign here on earth. And we'll see, see that as we get further in the book. He's got the authority. He's just not exercised it yet. There's a plan and a purpose that God is still working out. But that day is coming soon when Jesus will rule and reign. It won't be messed up like it is right now. I can't wait for that day. Amen? <coughs> and then we see in verse uh, 5, the next thing, to him who loved us. There's a great definition of who Jesus is. The one who so that he could be the ruler over kings and he could demonstrate the love he has for us. And then it says, not only did he love us, and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. We needed to be washed. Dirty. Stained by sin. And we needed that cleansing that can only come. There's no other agent in the whole universe that can wash away our sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's it. That's the only thing there is. There is nothing else. His blood washes away sin. That's an awesome thing to, to ponder. We're clean from our sin. Isn't that awesome to think about? Because his blood was shed for us. And that's the other thing. Notice the order there. It wasn't that he washed us and then he loved us. Right? He loved us and then he washed us. It isn't that we have to be perfect to be, become a Christian. We don't have to have perfection. In fact, we're not going to attain that until we die and become like him. But he loved us in spite of our imperfections. But he loved us in the state we were in, but he loved us too much to leave us in that state. So he is, his desire is sanctification, that process of making us, conforming us, as it says in the Romans 8, 28, no, 8, 30, I don't know, somewhere in Romans 8 anyway, being conformed into the image of his son, being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Day by day, moment by moment, that's God's desire to take us from where we were, and He wants to continuously work in us, to mold us, and shape us into the image of Jesus. So He loved us, and He washed us from our sins in His own blood, and, verse 6, has made us kings and priests to His God. He's made us kings, and He's made us priests. He's given us royalty. We're royalty. That's cool, huh? We're royalty, but we're servants still. <clears throat> we're both. The one who made us kings, he's the one who made us kings and priests. We're God's royalty and his special servants. And because of that, we have privileged access to the God of the universe. That's an awesome thing. When you look in the Old Testament and you see the temple... And all the division there was there. As Gentiles, we're on the outside looking in. Then you have another court where the Jews could go. <coughs> the ladies. The men could go a little closer to the, the Holy of Holies where God met with the high priest once a year. Then there was another court, just the priests. And then that one place, that Holy of Holies. 
The only access there was the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. That was it. So think of all the barriers there was to access with where God met with man. That's all gone in Christ. We have that access. We can go by all those, those <coughs> barriers, all those walls. We have access into the very presence of the Lord. Anytime we want, we can call out to God. This is an awesome thing. And he's made us kings, and he's made us priests, and he's given us that access. And when John wrote that, I think this is a little interjection by him. <coughs> After he said, made us kings and priests to his God and Father, he said, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He just, a little bit of praise thrown in there. Also, recognizing the reality that though he's made us kings and priests, the dominion is his, and the glory is his. It isn't that somehow that lifts us up. No, well, that should be humbling to us. And it should lift him up. And we do. We join in that praise. Oh, oh Lord, to you be glory and dominion forever and ever. <coughs> From here, it switches to not who he is, but who. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So a cloud can be people cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way the sin which so easily ensnared us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus and so on. <clears throat> but a cloud can speak of we who are saved, that will return with Jesus at his second coming. This is speaking not the rapture of the church, but his second coming. The rapture is when the church is taken out of planet earth, We'll see that when we get to chapter 4. But this is talking about after that time. He is coming. He will touch down on planet Earth. He will take his authority, his dominion. Everything's going to change. And every eye will see him. It isn't like he's coming in, a, sneaking into town in some way. Everybody's going to know when Jesus comes back. You're not going to have to wonder. Hey, I wonder if he's in Chicago. Or, or maybe he's in Paris. You know, no, no, no. He's coming to Jerusalem, and everybody's going to see it. We understand how easy that is in our day and age. We just take out the phone, right? No, there it is. We see the news. We see what's going on. <coughs> we'll be able to, every eye will see him. They will recognize him as their Messiah. They don't still today. But they will in that day. Thank you.